Hello, I'm Pastor Gillespie from St. John Evangelical Lutheran Church and School, Sherman Center, Random Lake, Wisconsin. It's good to have you with us here this morning for the Congregation of Prayer, a guide for daily meditation and prayer around God's Word. It is Wednesday, March 13th, 2024. Our catechesis today continues in Mark's uh, Gospel account. We'll be hearing uh, the preparation, Jesus preparing for the supper. Um, I'm going to split it into two readings. So we'll hear that part today, and tomorrow we'll hear the actual institution of this of the Lord's Supper. All right, so we'll have an opportunity to discuss both. That's because there's uh, quite a few, well, I think the right word is allusions to Old Testament stories that we probably should consider as well. All right, Jesus drawing all things, including all time and history and scripture into himself, it all testifies of him, of course. All right. So, let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Prayer Psalm, Psalm 125. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, from this time forth and forevermore. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous stretch out their hands to do wrong. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good and to those who are upright in their hearts. But those who turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord will lead away with evildoers. Peace be upon Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our verse is from 2 Timothy chapter 3. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16. Or reproof. We had to uh, do a little work with that word today in chapel because the children wanted to know what it meant. Um, and of course, here, um, an expression of blame or disapproval can be that um, to reprove, um, ignominy, shame, scorn, right? To, uh, huh, to reprimand, to rebuke, to reproach, to admonish, uh, to remonstrate. Um, it's the opposite of approval or praise. All right. Which is an interesting word, isn't it? This is, of course, one of the most uncomfortable aspects of being um, a pastor in particular, unless you're kind of, uh, you know, a masochist, you like inflicting pain on people, is to actually uh, point out uh, where God uh, disapproves of your behavior, your words, your thoughts. Um, I'll, I'll be, be honest, um, today, I think, I don't know if it's, I think it is cultural is that people don't look to their pastor, um, to provide such correction or, um, discipline, if you like, um, or direct, um, criticism, um, thinking the pastor is just mean or it's outside of his purview or it's not appropriate. Um, for some reason they think the, um, the enterprise of, <laughs> of the hearing, preaching and hearing of God's word is one of uh, just encouragement, right? And um, just to lift people up. Oh, my heart was lifted. Okay, well, this is true in the gospel. Um, but the, the gospel, forgiveness of sins, also, of course, um, well, what, what needs to be forgiven is always the question there. Um, the, back, the back side of that is, well, if there's forgiveness for what, right? And that's going to be personal um, it's, it, just by nature. It's going to be, what's upon your heart and your conscience. And um, yeah, um, we, we don't really have a, um, 
uh, worldly culture, certainly, um, even a, a churchly culture that expects uh, the pastor to tell us when we're wrong. And, uh, well, how dare he? And, and of course, there's a way or a manner or a mode uh, about going going forward with that to do it uh, with gentleness um, and, and with uh, amendment of life in mind and not just to hurt and harm. Um, so I try to remind you periodically that um, this is true of Jesus. He doesn't, he's, he doesn't say things to hurt or harm you. He says them for your, um, for your benefit, right? Sometimes they are difficult to hear. That doesn't mean they're not good for you. Um, and, uh, they, you know, there's a possibility that <clears throat> as the world becomes in, in <laughs> increasingly uh, more obviously evil, um, and uh, even our own Christians get drawn away by that, that uh, there'll be necessity for even more of that sort of correction. Uh, I'm trying to encourage myself by telling you this, <laughs> um, but also so that you expect uh, to receive that kind of uh, criticism or reproof, right? Which is the opposite of uh, approval. This is disproof in a sense. Um, and this also then connects to why, as we'll say in the catechism here in a minute, that uh, the pastor must not be a recent convert. And in a sense, um, the best pastor for a situation is the one who's already been through it before, because um, then he can uh, can actually uh, speak dispassionately, you know, without um, you know from a place of um, what do you want to say, anger or or um, not anger? Anger is the wrong word because anger can be done without sin. Of course, Jesus says, um, "Oh, and violence, right?" Or uh, with aggression, or um, you know, burn it all down kind of attitude. You know, nihilistically, right? We don't, you don't want that either. And that's the danger of a pastor who hasn't um, been tested and tried um, in his own life by God um, so that the word is proven true, right? And so that he can be approved by God. Um, that's the other aspect too, is uh, whether you are a pastor, or you serve in others, another vocation uh, as parent, right? Your approval, the approval you seek is not um, in the one that you um, are providing correction towards, or that you've been given authority to correct, you, the approval that you seek is from God, right? From that, uh, and uh, that that's the only place where you can actually have a good conscience or a clear conscience is when you're operating within the vocation that God has given you, according to the authority that He's bestowed on you, um, and seeking His approval, not the approval of men, even those you love, right? This is important for all vocations, especially uh, bishops, pastors, and preachers. So. Uh, let's confess that from the catechism. The overseer must be above reproach, the husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. 1 Timothy 3, verses 2 through 4 and 6. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Titus 1, verse 9. All right. Our first reading today is from uh, Job, chapter 3. You'll hear this in Jesus refer to this, I think, um, in our text for catechesis as well. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. And Job spoke and said, May the day perish on which I was born, and the night in which I, it was said a male child is conceived. May that day be darkness, may God above not seek it, nor the light shine upon it. May darkness and the shadow of death claim it, may a cloud settle on it, may the blackness of the day terrify it. As for that night, may darkness seize it, may it not rejoice among the days of the year, may it not come into the number of the months. Oh, may that night be barren. May no joyful shout come into it. May those curse uh, it who curse the day, those who are already arouse, or who are ready to arouse Leviathan. May the stars of its morning be dark. May it look for light and have none, and not see the dawning of the day, because it did not shut up the doors of my mother's womb, nor hide sorrow from my eyes. Why did I not die at birth? Why did I not perish when I came from the womb? All right, uh, you want to read some of the most um, intense laments of the scriptures. You read, you read Job, and 
um, in fairness, here, this is coming after he has quite literally lost everything. Um, and indeed, he's also suffering in his body uh, quite severely. So um, that he would curse the day of his birth. Um, he will come around, oh, that my Redeemer lives, and on the last day I shall see him, right? So even if I die, I shall live and behold the glory of the Lord. This this will be his confession, but um, we go through quite a bit before we get there. Those of you who have tried to read through the book of Job know how intense um, and difficult it often is to read. Um, I think it's included for us so that we learn to lament, in part. The Psalms as well, the Psalms of lament, but here, um, even the prophet, so that we um, learn what is appropriate to say. I mean, you can ask these sorts of questions of God, um, especially in a day of darkness and, and great difficulty. All right. um, we're going to see the inverse of Job, actually, in uh, the one who betrays Jesus. All right. We'll talk about that in a minute. So that's why we read this. Okay. Uh, then, yeah, the first part of our reading, we're just going to read up through, actually, just through 21 today. Now, on the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? And he sent out two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. Wherever he goes in, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, Where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared, there make ready for us. So his disciples went out and came into the city and found it just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. In the evening he came with the twelve. Now as they sat and ate, Jesus said, Assuredly I say to you, one of you who eats with me will betray me. And they began to be sorrowful and say to him one by one, Is it I? And another said, Is it I? He answered and said to them, It is one of the twelve who dips with me in the dish. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. Oof, intense, right? Okay, so we're on the uh, first day of unleavened bread. Yesterday we had two days until the Feast of Unleavened Bread. All right, this is specifically the day um, when you kill the Passover lamb. So the 14th day of the first month, right? Um, that indication of unleavened bread will, of course, come up with the institution of the Lord's Supper. So, of course, there's bread available to them. Um, also, the Passover, right? And the, not only the Passover, but the Passover lamb in particular, and the killing of the Passover lamb. So Mark is, is setting us up. The other evangelists do this to a similar degree. He's, he's setting us up for what is about to come, the death of the Passover lamb, our Passover lamb, Jesus, right? Um, and also the giving of unleavened bread. Um, I've told you this before, but it's worth reiterating here in that the night he was betrayed, the night he instituted the Lord's Supper, is also the same day that he is crucified as our Lamb. So the institution of Christ's body and blood for in the Supper is directly um, linked in the same day um, to his suffering and death. So as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death to come, which comes right after that, right? So it's time to kill the Passover lamb. This is, of course, important, as I said, because as uh, quoting John the Baptist, right, from John 1, uh, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is our true Passover lamb. Um, you also then see, just as we saw in baptism, you see here with the, um, with the Passover, is that Jesus, um, he prepares and he eats of the Passover, but he also then is there, thereby the fulfillment of the Passover. He's the last pass. It's the last Passover. Uh, so, by the way, this uh, the Christian fascination with uh, Passover meals, Seder meals. Um, I understand kind of the the impetus. Um, it's anachronistic, meaning it's out of time. Um, what people celebrate today as a Passover, even five hundred years ago, is not what was being celebrated here. That's one argument. I think another argument would be um, Jesus ends the Passover because he becomes our Passover, right? So now the Lord's Supper is, is the uh, Passover for Christians. We don't need to go back to the old one. We have the new one. <laughs> All right. Um, how were the disciples to find the room for the Passover? All right. Um, some, some details here. Two were to go looking for a man carrying a pitcher of water, which seems like a strange detail, doesn't it? 
follow him to the master's house and then say to the master, the teacher says, uh, where is the guest room in that where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? All right. This is significant because um, uh, actually one of our catechumens did a great job on this. Uh, baptism, water being led to the supper. Yes, correct. The disciples find the place of the supper by following water, even as the baptized are led to the Lord's Lord's Supper, to the Holy Supper. Right? Um, now, they uh, found it just as he had said to them, right? Oh, they will show you a large upper room, upper room, furnished and well prepared. All right. Now, upper rooms are pretty significant, especially in the prophets. All right. So uh, some of the children caught on to this. One was, was the book of First Kings. That's with uh, Elijah and the uh, um, the uh, the widow at Zarephath. Remember that story? Well, maybe I could share some of it with you. Um, this is after the bread, uh, the oil, right? The oil in the in the wheat or the grain. Now it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick and the sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. So she said to Elijah, what have I to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? There's a key. Killing of the son. That's also another uh, reference, right? See how it all um, is woven together here. This, it's one story. He said to her, give me your son. So he took him out of her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying. It could be the guest room as well, right? Upper room is usually the guest room. Uh, and laid him on his own bed. Then he cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, have you brought tragedy on the widow in whom I lodged by killing her son? And he stretched himself on the, out on the child three times and cried to the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, let this child's life come back to him. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the soul of the child came back to him and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. All right, so that's uh, the widow at Zarephath, and that's with Elijah. Uh, But we have a similar story from Elisha, right, who followed Elijah. This is with the Shunammite woman. All right, it happened... One day that Elisha went to Shunem where there was a notable woman and she persuaded him to eat some food. Oh, notice both death and resurrection and food together in both of those stories. Famine with Elijah and here. So it was as often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food. And she said to her husband, look now, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by regularly. Please let, me, let us make a small upper room in, on the wall and let us put a bed for him there and a table and a chair and a lampstand so it will be whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there. And it happened one day that he came there and he turned into the upper room and lay down there. And then he said to Gehazi, his servant, call the Shunammite woman. And when he called her, she stood before him. All right. Uh, skipping ahead, the child grew. Oh, they bore a son. The child grew. Now it happened one day that He went out to his father, to the reapers, and said, My head, my head, O sacred head. Um, (laughs) So he said to his servant, Carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him, brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon. Uh, Okay. Noon until three, right? The son with the mother. And then died. There you think of the uh, Pieta, right? With Mary holding her son. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. There's the grave. Then she called to her husband um, and said, okay, let's go get the man of God. All right. Now, skipping ahead, Elisha came into the house and there was the child lying dead on his bed. He went in, therefore, shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. He went up and lay upon the child, put his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes and his hand on his hands. And he stretched himself out on the child. That would be cruciform, by the way. And the flesh of the child became warm. And he returned and walked back and forth in the house and again went up and stretched himself on him again. The child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. Seven, the number of the week of perfection, of completion, of Sabbath rest, right? So death and resurrection here. The child opened his eyes and he called Gehazi and said, call the Shunammite woman. And he called her and she came to him, pick up your son 
So he went in, fell, she went in, fell at his feet, and bowed to the ground, and they picked up her son and went out. All right, beautiful story from El- of Elisha. All right, so you see in both of those stories, upper room, death and resurrection, and food, okay? So uh, not, uh, the, these are not coincidental details, um, and that you see history repeating itself or rhyming. All right. Um, then notice what he says. Go and find it prepared. And they went and they found it just as he had said to them. Right. So Jesus' words are faithful and true, um, even especially his words instituting um, the supper, which will come um, in our reading tomorrow. All right. Notice who's with Jesus the pa- at the Passover, the 12, 12 disciples. And Jesus announces, of course, that one of them will betray him. Uh, notice none of the disciples know, so there's no outward sign, right? But Jesus knows the heart. Is it I? Is it I? Um, the betrayer would be the one who dips with me in the dish. It's an interesting expression. I don't, um, I probably have to do some work on that. I'm not so sure. Apart from um, sharing in the food, right? Um, some would use this as a um, another demonstration of what Paul talks about if um eating and drinking the body and blood of Christ um, outside of faith is to receive it in judge to judgment. And that's the judgment of, of Judas. I mean, he's already betrayed him, but the judgment is that he no longer um, believes in him. And uh, thus by eating of the same food, he's bringing judgment upon himself. I think there's something to be said for that. All right. Um, but note it. All right, it's still streaming. <laughs> Sorry for that. We lost it there for a moment. Um, uh, my camera's out of focus now. We lost power just for a second there. Sorry for that. Uh, what were we saying? Judas. Oh, yes. Uh, notice verse 21. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him. Just as it is written of him. All right. So um, this is, of course... Uh, the same kind of expression as what we saw in verse 16, found it just as he had said uh, to them. So we're talking about um, a fulfillment of the scriptures. All scripture, of course, testifies of Christ. All right, and it is fulfilled here. Hmm. Uh, looks like the internet's not come back yet. Oh, there, it is. is it coming back? Okay, now we're back. Uh, hopefully you heard everything I just said. Uh, what did Jesus then say about his betrayer? Verse uh, 21. Now, this is back to our reading from Job, right? It would have been better if his betrayer had never been born. And here you want to think about um, Job again. I want to think about that reading from Job. Um, Job chapter 3, right? And so uh, I, I would suggest uh, making that comparison is really helpful because um, they are similar and yet they're quite unlike each other. All right. Um, Job is um, the one whom the Lord afflicted, and yet he um, persists in faith. Right. Um, Judas is the one who is tempted, um, and then is unfaithful and rejects the Lord. All right. Judas thinks that by betraying Jesus, he will have life. Job knows that by being faithful, um, he may lose his life. Right. But will receive it in. In eternity, right? So you can see the compare and contrast between those two. It's pretty significant, isn't it? All right. I'm sorry for the power drop there. Hopefully, um, you didn't miss too much. Uh, it's all going to be. It's all recorded, so it'll be uh, available uh, later in the day. I'll probably replace what uh, what gets uploaded, so you uh, you can go and catch what you missed if you missed it. All right. Good. Let's sing our hymn for the week. Jesus, priceless treasure, stanza. Oh, how about today we sing uh, stanza three? Yeah, three and four. Let's do three and four.
Death by heart he cry thee, Fear I bid thee cease, World thou shalt not harm me, Nor thy threats alarm me, While I sing of peace. God's great power guards every hour, Earth and all its depths adore him, silent bow before him. Hence all earthly treasure, Jesus is my pleasure, Jesus is my choice, hence all empty glory. Not to me thy story, told with tempting voice. Pain or loss or shame or cross shall not from my Saviour move me, since he deigns to love me. All right. Such a great hymn. Bold text and tune, right? You feel the confidence um, of both uh, the author and of the composer. All right, let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, your mercies are new every morning. And though we deserve only punishment, you receive us as your children and provide for all our needs of body and soul. Grant that we may heartily acknowledge your merciful goodness, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We pray this day for marriage and family, that husbands and wives, parents and children live in ordered harmony according to the Word of God. For parents who must rear their children alone, for our communities and neighborhoods, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray this day in Thanksgiving with uh, Randall and Ella, both celebrating their birthday. We pray for the households of our church, especially that of uh, Jody, Roger and Sherry, Marlene, Jeffrey, Len, and Timothy. Pray for our catechumens, Wyatt, James, Aaliyah, Cole, Lydia, Charlie, Kaylee, Kimberly, Mason, Kayla, Michaela, and Justin. Pray for all um, those ill, receiving treatment, or recovering, especially Ralph, Allison, Joe, Dennis, Brad, Billy Joe, Ron, Carol, Mike, Doug, Courtney, Renata, Sandy, BJ, District President Willie, um, and Phil. Pray for our homebound. We pray for the missions and mercy work of the church, especially that of Camp Luisimo, um, and for, the congreg- for our congregations to seek new and exciting ways to connect their neighbors with Jesus in outreach and witness, including ours. Uh, We pray that the Lord grant uh, additional enrollment for our day school. Uh, We also pray um, intercession for Joyce uh, Hoffman, that's uh, Vicki's mother, um, who uh, she just sent an update this morning, um, who stabilized, but uh, got quite a bit going on there, so we want to keep her in our prayers. We also uh, have a prayer request to keep Harriet Yench. She was a member here for many years. She's up in uh, Wausau with problems uh, with her kidneys and sugar levels, so keep uh, Harriet in our prayers as well. And we continue to pray for the family of Tommy uh, who grieves his death. For all this, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings and life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. 
Yeah. So uh, that's our congregation of prayer for today, Wednesday, March 13th, 2024. Hopefully everybody uh, uh, jumped back on after the uh, power outage here. It was just for a few minutes, but um, hopefully you jumped back on. And uh, yeah, if not, uh, you can go back and uh, catch what you missed. That's fine. Lord be with you all. Keep you safe. We'll see you again uh, in the morning. Well, actually, we'll see you tonight, right? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, we have uh, the meal at uh, 530, or our day school teachers are, are um, graciously providing that for us this evening. And then um, uh, we'll have uh, Vespers at at 6.30. And tonight um, we hear uh, most specifically preaching Christ and him crucified and how, um, how it's received um, both in faith but also um, by those who would reject him. All right? And we'll see how uh, inverted uh, the cross is, how even ironic. All right? So that's tonight. So if you can join us. Uh, in person, that's great. If not, uh, yeah, it should stream. <laughs> all right. So we'll see you um, then. God be with you all. We thank you for listening to this podcast from St. John Evangelical Lutheran Church Sermon Center in Random Lake, Wisconsin. If this podcast is of benefit to you, please consider supporting the work of St. John by visiting stjohnrandomlake.org that's stjohnrandomlake.org slash support and give today.